Mr. Alan Jones. Thank you very much. May I just say, it's absolutely irrelevant what political party you support, what religion you support, what geographical region in this country you come from. It's got nothing to do with any of that. This is a very, very serious engagement between those people who believe in the future of the country and maintaining the relevance of that future. This is not the first time we've done this, as you know. We firstly went to um, Oki on the Darling Downs in Queensland, and at all times we've emphasised these are not anti-mining rallies. I'm aware, though, that the way in which the mining industry currently is working, because it's under threat and under siege and under fear, and the way in which it operates, there'll be note takers here from the coal mining industry and the coal seam gas industry, and I welcome them. You take as many notes as you like, but just understand that it's you, not us, who are on the back foot. Because the, the you people have moved in without any authority from the community at all. You've moved in without any license, without any mandate. Well, now those people who actually own the community, the people, are having their say, and you'll find their argument infinitely more powerful than yours. I was, I was, encouraged, I was encouraged to go because, as most of you know, and you've heard me speak about this before, I went to a little one-teacher school as big as the area we're broadcasting from here in Western Queensland. And it was why I used to ride the horse five miles tied up under a pepperina tree. Some years ago, and I suppose it's three now, uh, people I didn't know had rung me and said, are you aware what they're talking of doing to Ackland? And I wasn't, so I thought I should go and find out. When I got to Toowoomba, where my sister lives, and she also went to this little one-teacher school at Ackland, she said, oh, do you want me to come with you? And I said, no, look, I don't think you should. I think this is going to be a bit emotional. I've got no idea where I'm going, really, or what I'm going into. To get to Ackland, you cross the railway line at the butter factory. And for me, as a kid that subsequently, you know, used the railway siding because they closed the school down and I had to go then in a rail motor, ride the horse five miles and go in a rail motor ten, another ten miles to go to another primary school. However, you'd crossed the railway siding and it was a dirt track and away you went. I've crossed the railway siding and spare me, I mean, there's a bitumen road as wide as all of these seats here. Yards wide. I thought, what the hell is going on here? So off I took. I was on my own. And the first thing I noticed was that here were all these farms and there wasn't a cow, there wasn't a sheep, there wasn't a horse. And then the houses seemed to be all locked up. I couldn't see a tractor, I couldn't see a harvester. And I kept on driving and I went past Kelly's property. I knew Kelly's, I knew Jenkel's, I knew Vertiers, I knew the Hueys, there was no one there. And I arrived at Ackland and there was nothing there, except seven little blocks. And they agreed to meet at the war memorial. Many of these farmers had given their lives in the war and their record was perpetuated through the memorial. And there was nothing. And here were these women. So before we even said, hello, how are you? I'm glad that you're here. I said, what the hell is going on? Oh, they said, we're meeting here because New Hope Gull are going to move the war memorial to Kalpai. And this has all been sold to them uh, by the Toowoomba Regional Council under the guise of the Rosalie Shire Council. And they've bought up 7,000 hectares, New Hope Cull, 7,000, all on secrecy agreements. So the poor farmer was told, listen, I know it's only worth 800 bucks a hectare, we'll give you 2,000 a hectare, because that's what he Mr Heffernan, the, the neighbour has done, they go, oh, Jesus, Bill Heffernan's going, I may as well go, and one by one they've knocked these people off. But of course, if you're not in the footprint, and you're just outside it, your property's not worth two bob. Not worth two bob. So we had this rally at Oakey, and one of the speakers was the father of a daughter who was a farmer outside the footprint, because I went to see the open-cut coal mine then, and it's 24-7, night and day. Anzac Day, no not matter about Anzac Day, they just drive the trucks and the bulldozers and the everything. And so when I went, I thought I'm gonna stay at night time. This is lit. The lights are so powerful, you could read a book at Mossvale if this was where the mine is. This is open-cut coal mine. You could read a book at Mossvale. So I waited and I met this young lady and she was 25 years younger than I am. 
she'd gone to the next one teacher school, Kalpai. And from Kalpai, she then went to Oki because Oki had a little high school then, a couple of teachers at high school. From there, she wanted to be a farmer, so she went to Gatton College. From Gatton College, she won a Rhodes Scholarship to Oxford University. And she met a husband, a scientist, and she married him. And they had a child over there, and she came home, and she was pregnant with another child, and suddenly she finds that she's on the ridge of this seven, she's not in the 7,000 hectares. It goes for miles and miles and miles. Unbelievable. All of which they're desecrating. All of which, well, stage three's not through yet. We may win that battle. But all of this is to be ripped up, the guts lifted out of it, prime agricultural land. And, of course, they've done this with the support and acquiescence of the Bligh government, which is broke. Broke. Spent money as if it was going out of style, and they think the mining industry is going to save them. So at the rally that we had, and Drew and all of these people were, were at this rally, it was magnificent. I mean, a thousand people in a little place like Oki. The father said he wanted to speak. And there was a lectern like this, and he had some notes. And he started to read his notes. 55-year-old man burst into tears. This is what these mongrels are doing to people. We're talking here not just about prime agricultural land and we're not just talking about urban land, we're talking about the heart and soul and psyche of individuals who are being destroyed, living night and day with the emotional nightmare that these predators are on their doorstep and unapologetically are saying, we'll wait, we'll wait, because the kid I went to school with, Glenn Butel, has said, I'm going nowhere. The one-man army is still there in Ackland. And when the ABC interviewed these New Hope plunderers, they said, well, what about Mr Butel? They said, there was a smile on their face. They said, oh, we'll wait. Means we'll wait till he dies. And that's how we operate. So this father stood up, 55 years of age. He started to read his notes. And he couldn't go on. And tears. I can't believe this. A farmer, a man with tremendous pride, humiliated by this, he starts to cry. And he folded his things up. He said, I can't go on. But he said, as he, unbelievable way he spoke. And he said, I've got one thing I want to say before I leave the stage. He said, um, I'll go to my grave guilty of child abuse because I encourage my daughter to be a farmer. And she's going to be abused for the rest of her life by these people because my farm's not worth anything. That's where we are. We're not just arguing here about the people in the southern highlands, for God's sake. One of the prime agricultural entities in the world. We're not just arguing here. This is everywhere. This is the Darling Downs. This is Oki. This is the beautiful Gloucester Stroud Valley, which was the origins of the colony of New South Wales. They rowed the ships up, up the river. They got them off and they built the Hunter Valley from Stroud. Beautiful, pristine, prime agricultural land. You could eat the soil. You could eat the soil at the Liverpool Plains. You could eat the soil of the Southern Highlands. You can eat it on the Darling Downs. You can eat it in central Queensland at Springshore. These people believe that they can move in and for the sake of a quick quid, undermine the agricultural future of this country and and our food security. Well, the message to them is it isn't going to happen. It's not going to happen here or anywhere. But today, the purpose of today, and, and I do appreciate your being here because there's a twin purpose. You're representing in your own simple way. We're all just ordinary people. Your commitment to Australia's future. I know Bill Heffernan, who's done a phenomenal job with all of this, almost a lone man in the parliament will talk to you about food, yes, he'll talk to you about food security and what this means. But you see, we know nothing. This industry has told us nothing about the extent of dewatering the aquifers on which so many farmers appear. But these people are going to use 150,000 Olympic swimming pools of water, what at the same time, I've just been to Mildura, where they're taking water away from farmers, ostensibly for the environmental flow of the Murray-Darling, and giving it for nothing to miners to pursue this sabotage of Australia's agricultural strength. So today, today is about, I hope, both protesting your commitment and your concern, but also being educated a little about what really is happening. This is not just about barrel. And we're not talking about just mining here. We're talking about it everywhere. We're saying that these people have got no proof about what damage they're doing to the aquifers. They're not prepared to admit how much water they're going to take. 
They're not prepared to admit the risks to public health like that woman Tanya Plant, whose two little girls are in hospital every second week. I took a person with me to this a friend of mine, the wife of my racing partner, Chris Massara. I said, Chris, come with me. And so we went out here to Ackland. I said, before we go, I want to drive you from John Darien to Dolby. John Darien's a little tuppenny, apey, tin pot place, you know, a little village. And as we drove along the John Darien Road, which is only no wider than twice the footpath here, we came to a coal stack. The coal stack was over 100 metres long. It was higher than the Opera House. It's uncovered. And there is Glenis Hammond and those families on this side of the road, their, their farms are worth nothing. And they live with this, these particulates in their house, in their washing, in their fridge, in their lives, in their lungs, every day of their lives. No one seems to care about public health. We don't care about the contamination of the aquifers. We don't care about the dewatering of the aquifers. We're not worried, are we, about food security? I'll tell you what, the Chinese and the Qataris are worried about food security. They've just brought, bought 10,000 hectares of prime agricultural land. This is also allowed by the federal government, of prime agricultural land in northwest Victoria. And they have a simple principle. They say our policy is from paddock to plate, from your paddock to our plate. They're smart enough to know that they're going to have to feed their own people in the future, the Chinese and the Qataris. They're going to feed them by buying up our farms. Last year, we exported 57,000 head of dairy cattle to China. Why wouldn't we say to China, well, we'll provide the milk. We are capable of feeding the rest of the world if we look after our prime agricultural land and our agricultural resources. I interviewed a bloke a couple of weeks ago. He's written a magnificent book called Too Much Luck. And you should buy it and read it. It's about, basically, we thought we were going to be rich forever and mining would make us rich. So he's just toured the Darling Downs, which is a metaphor. Peter used this word metaphor. It's a metaphor. We're trying, and Drew will talk more about that, the Darling Downs, 40,000 coal seam gas. It's unbelievable that anyone can allow this. And I'll talk later about what that means to water suppliers and so on. But he went to visit all of this. And basically, this is a fellow who writes the Australian newspaper. He just could not believe what he saw. So he said this. He wrote this, Paul Cleary. How did we allow them to turn a first world country into a third world country without us even knowing what was happening? In fact, he said, ask yourself one simple question. Did anybody actually ask the people? Did anybody tell the people that our farms and our homes would be invaded, that our water would be polluted and endangered, that our communities would be ripped apart, that our health would be at risk, that our environment and our culture and everything we hold dear would be taken away or damaged or placed at risk. That's what he wrote to me. And then, last week, I was speaking to a retired journalist who'd worked as a war correspondent in various hotspots of the world. And he wrote this to me. What is happening to the farmers in Australia with coal seam gas has a direct and very frightening parallel with what happened in Afghanistan in the 1980s. He said, as we know, the farmers of Australia have been invaded by the multinational mining companies. It's a simple fact. We talk about it, we read about it, we hear about it. The only difference is that the farmers of Australia have been invaded with the blessing of their own governments. He said, back in the 1980s, the farmers of Afghanistan were invaded by the Soviet Union in the same way. What the Soviet Union wanted, he said, was not the land, but the trillions of dollars worth of minerals buried beneath the soil. The only thing between them, he said, and what they wanted under the land were the farmers, who believed the land belonged to them. They treated the Soviets as their bitter enemy, and the men of the Mujahideen fought, and they never gave up. He said to me, in the end, they lost 80% of their fighting forces, but they won. He wrote to me and said, one might ask, is this the real reason the West is back in Afghanistan? 
Is it really about the Taliban or is it about the same trillions of dollars of minerals that are still buried beneath the ground? The journalist then made a very disturbing suggestion to me. And he said that 10 or 12 years ago, the big energy users of the world, the United States, China, certain parts of Europe, got together and said, now I wonder where our energy resources are going to come from in the next 50 or 60 years. And they then said, well, we'll just go in there and help ourselves to whatever slice we want. But here's the catch. He said, somewhere in the last five to seven years, they came and did their own intelligence on our country. Who they needed to buy off, who they needed to influence, who they needed to own. Too far-fetched, he said? Not at all. And of course, at many of these rallies, I brought it with me today, but I should, under the Freedom of Information, I got a list of lobbyists, it's this thick, and I often read them out as to who they used to work for, and they are now in the paid employ of mining companies. He said to me, have a look at who's on the payroll of the coal seam gas companies these days. Former politicians, former deputy prime ministers, former bureaucrats, former lobbyists, former heads of farming bodies, former heads of grain growing associations, oh yes, we'll stop at nothing for a quick quid, former newspaper editors and former journalists. He said to me, in fact, they did their work, that's the mining companies, with the same precision as the CIA. And he said, it's now emerging that these companies even employed leading investigative journalists in order to find out all the information and all the right people they needed for victory. And he said, and that's how they managed to get everything rolled out and locked up by the time the rest of us were just waking up as to what had happened, what had been done to the farmers and the people of Australia. He said to me finally, whether it's all too late, whether the horse has really bolted and the stable door is shut remains up to the people of Australia and to how much they really care. We're here today because we care. We don't want any medals for caring. We're here because we believe in the future of this country. We believe in the importance of food security. And we say to those people in the mining companies who argue that you and I don't own or the farmers don't own what's under the ground, we say we agree with that. We agree with that. But the news for you people, AGL and Santos and others, is nor do you. That stuff is owned by the people of Australia. And just because, and just because, and just because the previous Labor government in New South Wales, can you believe it, gave a five-year mining royalty holiday to coal seam gas mining in this state, a holiday, they pay nothing. The profits, and I'll demonstrate this to you later, the profits from a coal seam gas well are about $80,000. They've given, taken all of this, all of this, and we get absolutely nothing back. Now, of course, the O'Farrell government, we welcome Prue here, who's done a hell of a job in an impossible portfolio of community services, but she is aware she's seen it firsthand. The O'Farrell government was, well, was elected with a thumping mandate to do something about this. It's not just a matter of saying, oh, well, look, the licence were issued by the previous government. Well, they were. And you've got political power to do something to make sure that these people, we're not saying you can't mine, stay away from prime agricultural land and stay away from urbanised land. That's all you go somewhere else. But the reason they want to come to Barrel and the Southern Highlands and Gunnedah and the Darling Downs is all the infrastructure's in place. When Andrew Forrest wanted to mine for export or to China in Western Australia, he went where no one had ever been. He had to build the railway lines. He had to build the roads. He had to build the homes where workers would live. They don't have to do any of this. That's why they want to be here rather than out there where no one lives. They want to come here because the job is already done for them. Someone else has paid the infrastructure costs. And this story today, the message today is a simple one. You'll hear a continuing message today. And it's very simple. And we say to these people emphatically, and Drew is the man who coined the phrase, Lock the gate. You don't let them in. Let them take the next step. Let them take good luck. Because you might win in the courts of the Supreme in Sydney, but I even doubt it, but you won't ever win in the court of public opinion. And the court of public opinion is the final arbiter of all of this. So basically we're saying there's only about 4.1% of land in this country's prime agricultural land. We're right in the middle of it here. The Darling Downs is in the middle of it. The Golden Triangle in Queensland is part of it. The Liverpool Plains are part of it. The Gloucester Valley is part of it. Get out, stay away and don't come back. 
So that's the simple theme. To win this battle, we've got to keep our story and our message simple. The first thing you have to do, though, of course, to win the message is to understand the issue. And I hope that through being here today, you'll develop a greater understanding of it. Do sign the petitions. It's very important. Don't ever underestimate for one moment the power that you can exercise. These people tried to come in top of the farmers at Spring Ridge. They said, we are standing, we're staying, we're not going anywhere, and they mounted the vigil. Well, Santos eventually left. And Drew will tell a story about Victoria, where this has also happened, and no one in Victoria has dared to challenge the farmers because we have right, R-I-G-H-T, on our side, and the will of the people, as expressed here today, is a manifestation of the fact that we also have might, M-I-G-H-T, on our side.